Okay, this is the most data-heavy uh, lecture in this session, okay? So I apologize that uh, you're going to see a lot of numbers, but hopefully we can show you that data can make a difference. Okay, so I'm going to share with you some local results as well as from the Pan-Asian Resuscitation Outcomes Study. So basically the Panos group is uh, an alliance of like-minded uh, emergency and EMS uh, personnel that are focused on improving outcomes for our local population. So you've seen two of our key champions, Dr. Shin from Korea, Dr. Ma from uh, Taiwan, and as well as some of our local champions here in Singapore. And, you know, one of the things that moves us together is uh, this slide that, you know, Dr. Ma has shared, you know, that the demographics and the epidemiology of what we are facing is, is pushing us in this direction. When I started practice as a physician, you know, 20 years ago, you know, number one killer in Singapore was what? Anybody know? Anybody was practicing at that time? Pneumonia. Infectious disease. You know, pneumonia. Number one killer in Singapore. Today, you know, it is cancer, you know, heart attack, stroke. Right? And if you look at the rest of the countries in our region, you know, it is the same thing. Um, you can see that, you know, nowadays, it is actually near the top, all those in red. And even in the developing world, okay, where so-called, so you know, there are still a heavy burden of infectious disease, actually, the load of diabetes, heart disease, you know, heart attack and all that has overtaken the burden of infectious disease. And the other one that's very alarming is trauma. You know, all these Tata Nanos and uh, some, you know, the Hyundai's and all on the road that are, you know, leading to road traffic accidents. So, in uh, 2010, the PARS group basically uh, was established in collaboration with uh, these countries. And our aim is actually, we wanted to start with a disease that all of us uh, were affected with, which is out of hospital cardiac arrest, and provide better understanding of the trends in Asia, as well as have a view to, uh, oops, what I mean, to actually moving towards interventional kind of trials. And we have not stopped there. We are now moving on to trauma. So uh, we are, we're going to start looking at trauma and things like hypothermia uh, as part of our alliance. Okay, so for a start, some local data. So uh, we looked at uh, basically our cardiac arrest survival over 10 years. And these are some of the things we found. So we are comparing data from 2001 to 2010, basically. Okay, and if you look at it, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, uh, is a bit subtle, the age of our patients is actually slowly increasing. So you can see that, um, you know, the mean age has actually increased from 60 to 63 in line with, you know, what we are seeing in the emergency departments and EMS as well. You know, we have a rapidly aging population. Again, mostly predominantly male. The race, you know, distribution has about uh, remained the same. And I just want to point out, you know, 35% of them had a history of heart disease. In other words, 65% of our patients had no prior history of heart disease. And when they collapsed with a out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, that was the first indication that they actually have heart disease. Where are these happening? Majority of them, 70% still in the homes. Um, not quite a big load, uh, for example, in uh, public commercial buildings, healthcare facilities, um, nursing homes. Okay, and uh, Dr. Ma has talked a little bit about the value of mapping these and looking at your AED and CPR training strategy. Okay, what has changed over 10 years? So one thing that disappointed us, you can look, over 10 years, uh, 2001, 19.7% bystander CPR. 2010, you know, 22%. A little bit of improvement, not much. And this comes with 10, uh, a decade of uh, public CPR efforts. Okay? If you don't know, Singapore actually holds the Guinness Book of Records for the largest number of people trained in CPR in one, uh, one occasion. Okay? So uh, that was a few years ago when we see at Singapore Expo full of people doing uh, CPR training. Okay? And despite all these efforts, only a 1-2% increase in bystander CPR. So that makes us scratch our heads and basically the answer that we have is telephone CPR. Okay, and uh, that's why Benjamin Young is going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you look at public access distribution, 10 years ago, zero, nothing. Okay, and today we had, I think the, I'm looking at the most recent data there has about doubled from here. So we are starting to see more public access distribution occurring. 
Again, hopefully this will be a trend that will increase. Okay, of course we have also yeah, improved our ambulance system to put in mechanical CPR. Uh, of course, ADs uh, are already on all the ambulances. You know, we put in LMAs, we give IV uh, adrenaline or epinephrine, and we've started implementing post uh, resuscitation care. How about response times? Uh, we've actually been able to reduce the call to arrival at scene time, uh, previously from nine minutes down to eight minutes. And uh, you know, across the board, you know, arrival to patient site, 11 to uh, 9.9 minutes. So I think that also helps. Um, one of the things that we have done uh, in previous years is to actually put a motorcycle-based first responder. And we found that they can actually cut through the traffic and reduce by half the response times. So that has been something that's successful and we're trying to roll that out more. Okay. Um, however, there is a continuing challenge to meet response time targets. Well, number one, the number of events is increasing, the number of ambulances that we have is limited, and I think increasingly it will be a struggle to actually uh, keep or maintain even this uh, ambulance response time standards. Okay, so this is the money slide. Uh, if you look at where we are in yellow, this is what we call the food sign survival, and this is what you use to compare one community to another. So if you compare 10 years ago, 2.5, now today it is 11% survival. So that's a five-fold increase in the survival rate over 10 years. So I think that's something that you know we are very encouraged about, something to pat our back. And you know a lot of you here are people that have been involved in uh, doing this work and saving lives. Um, more importantly, I think there are also increased number of survivors that have uh, intact neurological function. Okay, however, you know, as we consider 11%, uh, you know, as a big improvement from where we were previously, um, you have heard that across the region, you know, and those that we consider of case, there's still some way to go. What were the factors that were important for survival? Okay, again, not rocket science. Okay. What, uh, the ones that are in green were the ones that uh, were significant in the multivariate analysis, bystander AED, post-resuscitation care. These were the two strongest ones, okay? At four times, uh, increased survival and 27 times. Okay, the ones in yellow were the univariate ones, bystander CPR, response time at eight minutes, ambulance defibrillation. Okay, and then the ones in blue, the ones that didn't seem to make a difference in the statistical model. And the other thing that we've been tracking is, remember our bicycle CPR rate was? How many? 22%, right? And this is actually the rate in recent times when we implemented the telephone CPR. And you can see that it's been climbing up to about you know, 50, sometimes we hit 60% with telephone CPR. So additional 30 plus lives saved per year compared to 10 years ago, and more than half of them will go back to a normal independent productive life. We just benefit from public AEDs, post resuscitation care, and also possibly from bystander CPR, faster response time, and ambulance care. Okay, so how about, you know, how do we compare with what's happening in the region? So these are the current first wave of uh, powerless countries that have been contributing data. And this is one of our first meetings. You can see a uh, slightly uh, more prosperous uh, Dr. Shin down here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ma down here. And uh, we have done a lot, I was reviewing, we have actually, as a group, published more than uh, 30 papers in the last three years, you know, and that's even before our main data set is coming. And that includes, if you want, uh, we have actually described the various EMS systems that we have uh, across Asia, and that will tell you the characteristics, you know, some are fire-based, some are hospital-based, some have nurses on ambulance, some have paramedics on ambulance, some have EMTs, you know. So there are different uh, characteristics across our region. And as I mentioned, the first wave of data comes from 2009 to 2012, two and a half years of data. And uh, our methodology is described here. Basically what we do is that we provide a free access to an online data entry software. And it is provided to all our members to actually enter in data, or they can export the data from their existing registries which we combine together. So we don't have, uh, you know, a few million dollars like a rock, you know, uh, with the same outcomes consortium to actually build this. We have done this on a shoestring budget, you know, with voluntary uh, participation from all the countries. We don't pay our sites to give data. 
We don't pay for data coordinators. We don't pay for anything. All we do is provide, you know, support and uh, mutual conservation. You know? Okay, what did we find? Okay, so these are the cities that have been involved in the, the first phase. Uh, you can see that it varies from very urban to uh, actually uh, some rural kind of areas. Some of the systems, majority are fire-based, EMS-centric, with the exception of uh, Malaysia and Thailand, which has a more hospital-based system. And uh, I just point out, okay, so Singapore has 46 ambulances for 5 million population. And if you compare it with, let's say, Seoul Metropolitan, which has 10 million population, 140 ambulances. You do max, you know? That's how many times difference. We are, we are twice uh, half the population, but we have uh, a quarter of the number of ambulances. And that's not even compared to, let's say, Tokyo, which has 200, or Osaka, you know, 8 million and 280 ambulances. Okay, so Singapore is uh, very efficient, right? Lean, lean, and good value for money. Right? <laughs> okay, and again, if you look at hospitals, okay? How many hospitals do you have? Okay, 5 million population, 7 hospitals, okay? Korea, okay? 63 for 10 million population. They okay, twice, remember, times 2, right? Okay, and let's say Osaka, okay? 270 hospitals for 8 million population. So, you know, you want to pay for money, come to Singapore. <laughs> okay, total of 66,000 cases uh, enrolled from all our sites over the last, uh, over two years. Okay, we substantially attempted 40,000. And uh, basically, the bystander CPA rates varied from 10 to 40%. I'll show you that. Less than 1% received bystander defibrillation. And uh, basically, survival rates uh, varied from zero to 30 percent, as well as survival to discharge, uh, that varied from 1.3 to 8.9 percent. Okay. And overall, basically, less than 5 percent had uh, good neurological function. Okay, so here's where I throw all the numbers at you, but I'll walk through some of the interesting points uh, that I, I found. Okay, so if you look at, again, the age of the populations involved, we are looking at slightly different populations, okay, from the Japanese who have one of the, you know, uh, more uh, geriatric, you know, heavy kind of uh, cardiac arrest population to, you know, relatively younger population, you know, UAE 49 years, 55 years in Thailand, 57 in Malaysia. Okay. Majority are still at homes and residences, okay, and um, witness arrest again varies, okay, from like 26% in Thailand to up to 59% or even 67% in Taiwan. Okay. Um, look at first rhythm, BTBF is relatively rare. Okay. Usually less than 20%, in most of our sites less than 10%. So again, this is in contrast to European and North American studies where VF, witness VF, uh, uh, VF as a first rhythm is actually about double what we are reporting. So in other words, um, there could be a few reasons for this, okay, we postulate one is of course response times are longer, two is that, you know, we use a lot of beta blockers, okay, three is that, uh, you know, there may be slightly different etiologies uh, underlying what we are talking about. Okay, bystander CPR, this one is the one that a lot of people are interested in, okay, so Singapore 24%, 40% in Japan, 42% in Korea. And I want to highlight Korea, okay, and you know, congratulate Dr. Shin you know, on what a great job he's done. When I started visiting Korea, and that was five years ago, six years ago, my standard CPR rate was like 5%, less than 10%. Okay, and in the space of, you know, four or five years, they have jumped from 5% now to 40%. I think that's a phenomenal job, really excellent. And the Japanese have done the same thing, but over a 10 year period. Okay. Public access defibrillation, you can still see very low. Okay, less than 1%. Okay, response times again vary. Okay, so from 6 minutes in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, 5.9% uh, 5.9 minutes, very impressive. Okay, to uh, 20 minutes in Malaysia, for example. Okay, and again, there are challenges with uh, we call it a more rural kind of setting. And for example, in Malaysia, the system is based in a hospital. So the ambulance actually only, in a city, the ambulance will only come from two hospitals, let's say, that serve the whole city. So it's very challenging to have fast response times in that kind of setting. Okay, good sign survival. 
So remember, we are comparing survival to discharge. I think 31%, 30%, 11%, 23%. Okay, and there were two countries that actually reported no survivors in the two years. And I want to point this out that you know the fact that they are willing to report this and report that they have no survivors is something that is to be commended. You know, and I think it shows their determination to improve. And the only thing you can do is go up, right? I mean, you can't get any any worse, right? So they are only going to improve from here. So I want to encourage us that you know when we do this kind of benchmarking, it is not actually to say I'm better than who or or who is you know uh, worse than me. But the point is that you know we want to actually show evidence to our policymakers and our community, and track that as we go along and, and implement efforts to actually improve our systems and save more lives. Okay, these are all uh, resuscitation attempted, and again, when you put in all resuscitation attempted, the survival rate changes dramatically. Okay, so we are talking about five percent, nine percent, you know, three percent, six percent. Okay. So actually, these are more reflective of the whole population. Because if you remember, witness VF less than 10% in most of our Asian communities. So I believe actually we should be looking at this as a better indicator. You know, because we have more A systemic and PA arrests than we have VF arrests. Okay, and this is like a summary slide. Okay, we have the good time survival down here for all our countries. Okay, and the survival of hospital discharge and the CTC. Okay. And of course, by standard CPR and distribution. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll put some of these up in our website as we go along, and uh, these will be reaching manuscripts and uh, publication hopefully soon in the next few months. So what's the future hold? We are moving towards uh, welcoming these five new countries to Paros, and uh, it's growing rapidly. We have moved to a interventional phase with uh, dispatcher assisted CPR package. And uh, let's try and see this works. So give you an idea of what we are trying to do, okay? So this is thanks to uh, Dr. Ng, YY, and uh, the SCDF. And this is one of his drivers, I think, the ambulance driver. There's <laughs> some Hollywood training there. This is a real dispatcher, one of our primary survival for 
Uh, the hospital discharge in Asia still remains relatively low you know, compared to Europe and North America. But I think we have on our hands a tool to actually measure what we are doing and actually see the effects of various interventions that we can roll out in the future. And starting with you know, public access, uh, defibrillation and dispatch assisted CPR. Thank you very much.